Thank you, Michael. Really excited to be here. So how many of you know scope economies, like what scope economies are? OK, so, so I'll, I'll introduce that in, in a moment. So um, you know, imagine you're running a startup. Everything's working well. Your product's successful. And you're at that, at that stage where everything's growing and it's, you're scaling. And you have to think about, like, what's next? Do we just keep doing what we're doing and keep growing? the way we're growing, and, um, or do we do something different? Uh, I've been with Datadog for about six years, and I'm here to share our own experiences and journey in, um, in really figuring out like, how do we go to the next level of growth, um, and how we, we move from where we are to, to the next level. So it's a little bit about Datadog. So we are a monitoring and analytics platform for dev and ops teams uh, that are building applications for the cloud. Founded in 2010, we have about 500 employees, around 6,000 customers. And uh, this summer, we crossed about $100 million in annual recurring revenue. And we're growing at about 100% a year. So scope economies. So scope in economies is a very simple concept. When you're, doing, when you're doing something and uh, it's successful, you can leverage the same resources, i.e., in most cases, marketing and sales, to push more products, uh, because then your cost of, cost of sale remains the same, or cost of marketing remains the same, but you can sell more products through it. So that's what really Scope Economies is. Um, and, and the question like, you, know, you have to ask is, how, do we, uh, how it relates to to growth and product is when you have an MRR chart like this, um, what do you do next? Like, how do you attain those scope economies? And, and what are some of the questions you ask yourself? And in case of Datadog, this is what we were wondering about uh, in 2015. So this is uh, 2015. We're looking at product. Everything was growing really well. Um, sales was going um, gangbusters. You know, marketing was, was doing well. We were generating leads. Um, and, um, and, and everything was going in the right direction, up to the right, right? Like, so CAC was great, LTV was great. Like, you know, we could just keep doing what we were doing. Uh, but the things we had to think about is, like, if we keep doing what we're doing, perhaps at some point we'll plateau out. So we have to, we have to try and figure out, like, all these other things that we're building around sales and marketing. Can we leverage that to, to generate more out of what we, what we have built? And the way we looked at it was uh, this, this very simple model, which is uh, a growth matrix that says, OK, what do we do to grow? So for instance, we could do more market penetration. We could do market development. And these are very simple things. Like It's almost like no-brainers. So for instance, um, market penetration is really hiring more salespeople, doing more marketing in, in the regions that you're already doing well in. Of course, if a company is doing well, you'll, you'll do that anyway. Uh, market development, which is uh, if you're successful in the US, for example, going into APAC, going into uh, EMEA, all that sort of thing, you have to do it. Like you know, These are not real questions or strategic decisions. These are things that you have to do. Uh, the third dimension is, uh, or the third quadrant here is uh, diversification, which is uh, introducing brand new products to new markets, which as a startup, like it's almost like a a non non option because you're you're small, you're still growing, and you don't want to take on too much risk of trying out new things that you know nothing about. What that leaves you with is product development, which is ultimately looking at the markets that you've already developed, where where you're already selling what you're selling, and finding new products to sell in the same markets. So this is the question we had to ask ourselves. Are we ready for product development or not to achieve, achieve economies of scale and hence growth, uh, scope and hence growth? So, so what, what are some of the reasons that, that, that you want to add new products? So, so one reason is that you are flush with cash and you have the ability to do it, so, which is a simple reason. Um, the second one is platform affinity. In our case, uh, we had a platform where it, was, it lended itself well to building new pro adjacent products to what we already had. Uh, so 
so this was a this was this was another answer that we were looking for and we got that the third one was market opportunity so we were we were in this situation where you know when we first started out with datadog like it was really hard to raise funding actually because people thought infrastructure monitoring who wants to who's going to who's going to buy that but what happened was that the bet we had made which was that cloud and uh, dynamic environments would take off had taken off and that was that was changing all the tooling, all the architecture of new applications that were getting built. So there was opportunity, like not just the opportunity that we had uncovered, which was our own product, but there were adjacent products that were also being displaced by, uh, by this re-platforming of applications that we were seeing. But most importantly, like all of these things were important, but most importantly, our customers were telling us, and you know, in an earlier segment we talked about uh, Customer development, this is like the key thing at Datadog. Like this is the one thing that we do more than anything else. So, so all our customers were telling us that, hey, when I solve my problems, and you know, with the monitoring analytics platform, usually you solve problems of application performance, availability, and so on. I use Datadog, and I use three other products adjacent to that to solve my problems. So I need to do context switching, which is very difficult for me, and I have to piece together data and, and so on. So what if you could give me all of these things in one context? So we, saw, we thought, OK, this, this sounds like a good opportunity to build some, some more uh, things in the adjacent areas. But, but we were worried, right? Like We were still worried about it. So, so some of the things that we were worried about were, were like we were still a 200-person company, or I think 100-person company in, in 2015. So management bandwidth was a key consideration. Like we, we thought about it, like if we took on a challenge of building one more product, it was going to be us driving it, right? Like it, it's not like you just delegate it away to someone. So we had to think about that. The second was, you know, this is from previous experience, before, even before Datadog. When you acquire a sales team and you're you're having them sell products for you, you can, you can train them to message around one product. You can train them to message around a little bit more. If the product is complicated, you can do more training. But at some point, um, you run out of like, how much you can train. So people, people will gravitate toward one product. So we were worried about like, adding too many products to a nascent sales team that was just learning how to sell this. Uh, whether it would cause cause issues for us or not, and then the third one was uh, brand dilution. Like you know, if a product is successful and the product's working well, right? Like it's it's uh, it's kind of scary sometimes to think of adding more products to that same mix, because what happens in those cases is um, if you add too many products. Uh, no one, no one understands anymore what you stand for. Like we were a cloud monitoring platform, monitoring and analytics for the cloud. Now, if we added way too many products that did all these different things, which albeit could be could be adjacent, uh, it may it might have diluted our brand. Like we didn't want to do that. So, so this was another key thing that we we thought about. But the number one thing, the most important thing for us, was the core platform development. Here was a product that was already successful and selling and growing really fast, and all its metrics were through the roof, and not messing that up to, to go try other things. Like that, was, that was a key consideration. Because as you know, once a product becomes successful or relatively successful, now <laughs> you have competitive pressures from two sides. One is all those VCs who couldn't put money into your product or your company in the last round they'll start funding other companies that, 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 that could potentially be your competitors. The other side is all those uh, bigger companies that, that poo-pooed your idea and thought, oh, your product's not, uh, not going to be successful, whatever. They suddenly start to see you grow, and uh, they start investing in new products as well. So making sure that the core product for us, the most important thing here was making sure the core product that we had um, was was being developed fast enough that no one could catch up to us on that. So, so what we did was very simple. It, it wasn't any magical thing. We, we kept the core platform 
team as is. We, we kept growing it at the same clip. Uh, there was no changes to it at, at all. Then we introduced a new product called Application Performance Monitoring, which was completely adjacent to what we were doing um, um, initially. And we built a brand new team around it. This team was, um, we picked one or two people from, from within the company, and then we added more people around them. Because in this case, uh, the people we needed were the people who would understand our core SaaS platform and build on top of it. So, so these people, they, uh, they ramped up really quickly, and then we kept adding more and more developers to that mix to, to develop the new product. And then the third one, we added logs to, to the mix, which is also an adjacent thing to monitoring. And for this, we acquired a startup. Like We, we looked at the opportunity cost of, of trying to build a team ourselves and developing all the, all the expertise in-house. And we found a fantastic startup uh, with people who understood the technology really well. They understood the space, the, uh, the domain very, very well, and we acquired it, and, and, and we, we grew with that as well. So, which brings me to pricing considerations and some of the things that you really have to think about when you are adding new products to, the, to, your, to your one initial product. So, the real question, the, the real question that you have to answer yourselves for, for yourselves is whether you need to bundle or not, right? Like, do you bundle new products that you add. We, we heard a lot from previous speakers about packaging and so on. So do you package the new products that you add with the current products you, th that you already have? Or, or do, you, do you sell everything a la carte? So bundling has its advantages. So you, know, you, can, you can create a very nice sales training deck with nice architecture diagrams that tell, you, tell, your, um, tell your salespeople how to sell the whole bundle. Uh, Product positioning can also be somewhat easier because, at least from a marketing perspective, you can tell a story around why all these products fit together, why you need to buy them, et cetera, et cetera. You can also get very high attach rates, uh, at least from my experience. You can, you can shove a new product into the bundle and just have it be attached to those bundles because once a SKU is available, your um, sales teams will sell them, right? Like, and uh, sometimes these products get, get attached into these queues, whether or not the customers need them immediately or not. So you can start to see some success with the products, in other words. And then potentially higher adoption. Uh, that's an interesting point with bundling, because uh, oftentimes what happens with bundles is um, you start and you bundle a product with, with your initial product. And your customers may not use everything that you've put into the bundle initially. Like, I was a LaTeX user until I bought Microsoft Office. And then eventually, I started using Word. I was also a sort of Luddite, old school. But, but just the fact that Microsoft Word was available on my desktop made me start to use it, right? So, so there's a potential of higher adoption. But there are, <laughs> there are caveats to it. And in my own experience, I've found many, many different problems with bundling. So first of all, it is, um, there's a loss of potential upside. And, and let me describe it. So, so for example, when you have one product and you bundle a second product with it, there's an expectation that the two, bundles pro two bundled products are sold at a certain price point. So, so you sell, because you're giving someone a deal by, by buying the bundle, right? Like, so, so whether or not the customer needs it at, at the time or not, you, you push the bundle and you sell the second product, potentially at a discount, uh, because it's in the bundle. And uh, this product is actually really good. So, so what, you're, what you're losing as a part of selling it in the bundle is potential upside from this product in the future. Like you could have what you could have sold because it was so good by itself. Uh, you are now discounting and giving away by creating this this artificial bundling type of mechanism. The second thing, the second unintended consequence of bundling that happens sometimes, is um, is weird uh, weird ways that people start selling these products and people start packaging these products. Like one company I worked at, that shall remain unnamed. There was a product manager who would 
throw in their product with every successful product and create a bundle out of it. And the reason they did that was their product would get attribution, right? Like every time it got sold with the bundle, they would get attribution and it would seem that their product, you know, even if it was a shit little product, it was doing great, right? Like so, so, so it creates these perverse type of incentives for people to package things together. And you know, yeah, sure, you can do all kinds of Monte Carlo simulations on how much you would, you would make and et cetera, et cetera. But you know, it creates a weird dynamic and it's very hard to untangle what's actually being used and what's getting the, the attribution in these cases. And the third one is customer dissatisfaction. Imagine you're a customer and I sold, I sold you three products bundled together for the price of two, right? Like just, just think of widgets, right? Like I sold you three for the price of two. Now at the end of the year, you realize when your renewal comes up, you realize that you only use two of the three products. You might come back to me and say, hey, I'm only using two of these three products. I want my money back for the, for the third one. You don't, you don't rem remember that you, you got the third product for free, essentially. So it creates all kinds of, like, you know, customers become dissatisfied with uh, bundles that may have been pushed in some ways. And I'm not saying, like, you know, the, the bottom line here is I'm not saying that you don't bundle products together. What I'm saying is when you do bundle them, you have to think very carefully and think of, like, you know, if these products actually do fit together really well and also give customers a, um, a way forward without buying the, the products in a bundle. So what we did was we created a core platform which, which has already always existed and we we started adding new products to it where people could buy each of these things separately. So logs they can buy on top of our core platform, APM they can buy on top of our core platform, and this is our strategy going forward with other things as well. As we add them, customers can add those on without artificial bundles. So in conclusion, if there are three or four things that I want, to, want you to leave with, um, at least from my experience, that I think are important. One is the timing of the scope, scope economies, which is looking at market opportunity. Like, you know, all the things that you look at when you are starting a new company, which is, is there a total addressable market that you can, you can get to, uh, et cetera, et cetera, at, at this time, very important. Remembering the customer benefit of adding another product that is adjacent to your product. It's very easy to think of islands in themselves type of products that are somehow in marketing messaging can, can work well together. But finding products that actually fit together and, and by being bought together or by being used together improve efficiencies is a very, very important thing in adding new products. And then finally, <laughs> bundle with caution. Make sure that you're not doing it for the wrong reasons. So thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, you having me, and um, thank you. <laughs>